So let's talk about some of the progression within the popes during this time period. We start with Pope Pius VI in 1775. 1775, that's the time the American Revolution almost. Was he supportive of the American Revolution? No. Right? We're trying to keep the old social order intact. And so he wrote a papal bull attacking the ideas of philosophers who advocated for a new social order. Because, after all, the church is based on divine order. God wanted the church to be this way, with me ruling over it. In 1798, the French army took Rome and declared that the Pope was no longer the temporal ruler of the city. What happens then? The Pope just becomes the spiritual ruler of Catholicism. In 1804, Pius VII, his successor now, traveled to Paris to consecrate Napoleon as emperor. Think about this for a moment. Napoleon has invited me to come crown him as emperor. What a great thing. Remember how the Pope crowned Charlemagne as Holy Roman Emperor? Here I am as Pope going to crown Charlemagne. The Pope gets there. He's ready to place the crown on Napoleon's head. And what happens? Napoleon takes the crown out of his hand and puts it on his own head. What a powerful symbol that you as a pope are not crowning me. You have no authority over me. I invited you to Paris to humiliate you. Pius IX was the longest ever pope in office. From 1846 to 1878, that's 32 years. Pope John Paul II almost, he tried his best to keep up with him. So during 32 years, this is the paradox pope here, Pope Pius IX, because the popes were losing power, temporal power. They no longer had the papal states in the same way. And so he declares himself infallible. Or more correctly, a council declared him infallible. He convened the Second Vatican Council, but even before then, he was expelled from Rome in 1848. 22 years before the Vatican Council. He was expelled from Rome. His sovereignty was limited to a few palaces, today the Vatican City. And so to reaffirm his power in religious matters, in 1854 he said, I am telling you the gospel truth, Mary was conceived without sin. Shirley was conceived a sinner, original sin. Nancy very much so, conceived a sinner. <laughs> original sin. Right, we could go around the table and, and, and call each other out for being born in original sin. There was one person who was not born in original sin, and that was Mary. Fascinating. 1854. More than 1,800 years, nearly 1,900 years after the fact. Mary was conceived <clears throat> without sin. Caused division in the church. The way we overcame the division was by calling together a council and saying, Bishops, I would like for you to declare me infallible. Did all the bishops toe the line? How interesting. This is the first time that a pope ever declared a dogma on his own. Before that, remember, what was their history as a church? We always gathered in council and talked about these things. It wasn't one person going off and making these decisions by him or herself. But Mary was conceived without original sin. We always talk about these things as a council. When we gathered together the council then, Let's flash forward to 1870, the First Vatican Council. He, the council declared him infallible when speaking ex cathedra on matters of faith and morals. How many times has that been used since? Only once. And that was with the Assumption of Mary. We'll read about that in a moment. But, in effect, what was happening was he was trying to justify what he said in 1854, which caused division in the church. Okay, how do we bring division back? By telling everyone that I am infallible. I'm losing power here. My ratings are going down in the polls. How do I raise my ratings in the polls? Well, let's get it by, by have people believing I'm infallible. Well, how did the bishops vote? Interesting. More than 600 bishops attended. 522 voted in favor. Two against. Those were brave bishops. And more than 100 abstained. Ouch. I think I probably would have been one of those who abstained. It, it would have taken someone very brave to have voted against. It's easier just to abstain. So there was not a consensus on this issue at all, which is why bishops from the Netherlands, Austria, and Germany, 
they said, we will no longer be part of this church. Y'all believe that someone in this church can be available? We are no longer part of this church. They founded the old Catholic church, the tradition of which we are part. Because they enjoyed apostolic succession. They were validly consecrated bishops. And the Archbishop of Utrecht in Holland enjoyed the fact of being able to consecrate bishops without Rome's approval. And so he continued consecrating other bishops, giving them apostolic succession. And that results today in independent Catholicism in the United States. Well, let's go back to a syllabus of errors before the Vatican Council in 1864. Now that liberalism is flourishing, how do we counter their ideas? He did this by publishing his syllabus of errors. These are all the things that people have said that are absolutely crazy and wrong. What are some of the things that are wrong? Well, actually, he was the, let, let's talk about what is right. He says that ancient scholastic theology, think St. Thomas Aquinas, is consistent with scientific progress. You can reconcile our theology and our science. He said people are not free to choose the religion they consider to be true. There is one true religion, and that is my church. He said Protestantism is not a form of Christian religion. The East-West split, 1054, did not occur due to the arbitrary behavior of popes. For people like Father Jamie who are saying that, no. Didn't come down to that. The good order of society does not require public schools free from the authority of the church. If they're going to be schools, then they should be somehow connected to the church. Public schools. Church and state should not be separated. Those who believe the church and state should be separated are in error. And the Catholic religion should be the only religion of the state. Those who believe in pluralism, that people should be able to choose their religion in any country, that's craziness. Everyone should be the one true religion, which is the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church. That's an introduction to Pius IX, our longest ever serving pope. <clears throat> His successor was Leo XIII from 1878 to 1903. <clears throat> not so smart. He said that Catholics should not vote in civil elections. What would happen if all the Catholics didn't vote in Austin? Great. What happens? Catholics just lost the voice in Austin. We don't vote. So Catholics didn't have any opportunity to shape the early nation of Italy because the Pope told them, thou shalt not vote. In 1885, he declared democracy incompatible with the church. The church is not a democracy, and we don't lift up democracy as a model. 1891, though, was the real socially conscious thing that Leo XIII did. He wrote a work called Rerum Novarum, New Things in English, where he talked about the mutual rights and obligations of the rich and the poor, of capital and in labor, labor, giving rise to the Catholic trade union movement, to which Joe referred earlier, the Catholic worker. In 1893, he admitted the value of historical study of the Bible. You can study the history of the Bible so long as it doesn't weaken the authority of the Bible or the church. That's a tough one. Follow that? You study the history of the Bible, but if you come up with something that takes away from its authority or our authority, then you can't, can't come out of that. His successor was Pius X, 1903 to 1914. We're getting up to the time of World War I now. A very conservative man who condemned all modernists, who, who dared apply new methods of research to scripture or theology. If you try to think in any innovative way, that is bad. Benedict XV insisted on his right to rule the usurped papal states. He said, Italy has taken away my papal states. Next pope is Pius XI from 1922 to 1939. Pius XI encouraged missionary work, doubled the Catholic missions that we had throughout the world, consecrated the first Chinese bishops. Interesting, he's the one who canonized St. Therese of Lisieux uh, because he thought that that would be a good model of Catholics to imitate. Here's this humble, pious woman who is obedient to authority. What do we want Catholics to be? Humble, pious people who are obedient, like St. Therese. 
He set the goals and rules of Catholic action, the most important lay Catholic organization of the, 19, of the early 1900s. In 1933, whoa, this is getting up to the time of Hitler. 1933, he wanted to reach an agreement with Hitler, so he signed a qualified approval of the Nazi regime. Probably not a good thing. But then later, four years later, he did issue an encyclical against Nazism and against communism. It was his successor, though, that was criticized for World War II. His successor was Pius XII from 1939 to 1958. Very authoritarian man, very clerical. Tried to be neutral during World War II, which is why he's often accused of not coming out and saying anything against the, the Jews who died in the Holocaust. But he did announce the atrocities committed by the Nazis against Polish Catholics. The thing was that Pius XII really was less concerned with Nazism, more concerned in the East with communism. So the question is how to stop communism. Any of us who grew up in an era of praying for the communists and for the conversion of Russia, that's thanks to voices like his. <clears throat> for the conversion of China, oh boy, I still remember those. He threatened excommunication for all who supported communism. So he was the only one who ever used the doctrine of infallibility after 1970, and that was to declare that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. The Eastern Church, the other patriarchs, had no problem with thinking of the fact that Mary died like the rest of us. They call it the Dormition of Mary, when Mary died, when she fell asleep. It was him in 1950 who insisted Mary did not die. Instead, Mary was assumed into heaven. It's a very Roman Catholic teaching. In 1950, he warned against innovations in theology, and he silenced theologians like Pierre Taillard de Chardin, a very uh, revolutionary Catholic voice. So de Chardin was not allowed to publish any of his works, as great as they were. After he died, people ended up publishing them. During his lifetime, he was never published. And to his, to his credit, he did bring non-Italians into the Curia. Wow, the Curia is the central bureaucracy of, of the Roman Catholic Church. He brought in non-Italians. <coughs> he brought in cardinals that were from different countries, made the College of Cardinals more international. And he essentially started to set up the machinery which in 1961 to 62 would result in the Second Vatican Council. Which is where this course leads off. We've set the stage for another course on the history of the Second Vatican Council. With this history of reform and counter-reformation, how we as a church responded to it by setting up seminary systems and insisting on uniformity, things like Latin mass throughout the whole world, uniformity to this complex history of independence and liberalism and progress, and the church's response to that. So all that to set the stage for the 1960s, when we gathered together 600 bishops, excuse me, 2,000 bishops from the Second Vatican Council, to talk about these things as well with the radical new vision of the church. Rather than the church being a pyramid, Vatican II turned the pyramid on its side, the pyramid fell over. So it said, no, no one is higher than anyone else. We're all floating in the same ocean, and when you're floating in the ocean, is anyone higher than the next person? No. It was a radical council, Second Vatican Council. 